All right, friends and neighbors, time now for another networking video. Today, we are going to talk about expanding our DHCP and DNS topologies. Now, really, the focus of this video is DNS servers, but I thought I would talk a little bit about DHCP and just remind us that the servers are actually talking to each other. So we'll, we'll do that here first. So this is our topology. I have four servers running, a pair of DNS and a pair of DHCP, and you can see that everybody's in the low numbered IP addresses for 172.16 network. And what we're after here in this video is to talk about what goes on in between the servers. And then I'll also show you the updates to the configuration files, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other files that are out there. But first, uh, DHCP primary and secondary, or primary and backup. And remember that DHCP backup is not uh, really about failover, but it's more about load balancing and being able to cover for each other. But of course, there is the, uh, the failover part too. And when we were talking about DHCP servers, remember that we had this whole set of parameters that we put in dhcpd.conf uh, that talked about how the, the communication was going to go between the servers. So it was communication parameters that governed that sort of communication. And the big ideas were, well, when do I pick up for a server that has failed? How do I know if my, my server or the, the primary or the secondary is supposed to provide the lease? So on and so forth. And this came down to things like the timers, but also that split value. And the split value is what determined that, right? And there's a hash in the RFC that says, well, listen, if your, your transaction ID, which really is not the transaction ID for DHCP, but really goes back to one of the options, which turns out to be a MAC address, uh, that determines whether or not, you know, the primary or the secondary is going to provide the lease. Okay, so let's take a look at our, our VMs, and then we'll take a look at a capture. So I'll just run through the VMs real quick. You can see at the top, I've got my, my names. So I've got my DNS here and a backup DNS. I've got a primary DHCP and a backup DHCP and the clients are not yet started. So we'll come back to the primary and secondary DNS, but you can see this is 172.16.01. This is 02. This is 03 and 04. All right, so at this point, all I did was start up the VMs. Um, I did not start the services yet, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. But before we do that, we want to look at or at least start the capture, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so let me uh, let me start the capture, and then we'll go. Well, actually, before I do that, let me show you the configuration file. Okay, and this, this is a blast from the past, right? And all that I've done here is added an extra domain name server because, well, I added a domain name server. And I changed the uh, addresses that we had for the, the DHCP servers in the previous video, so now everybody's in the happy 172.16, and I've figured out what I wanted my addressing to be. And this was the big deal about the, um, the peers, right? We've got the timers that indicate the the server performance you can take a look at the other videos for that there's the split value that I was talking about and then here is the range of addresses so 20 and 29 and the the backup server looks exactly the same well not exactly but you know really close okay a little less in there maybe um, there we go. I, I also decided to, in a couple of the config files, I did things a little bit different way just so you, you can, right? So in the primary, I put these on different lines, but of course you can put them on the same line. And here the address is dot four, and then the peer address is dot three. And then we come down here, and we don't have all of the options for the peer because the primary governs the split and things like that. And then we've got the same same configuration here. Now if I remember right, I got a little crazy in my configuration, too many experiments going on at the same time, but really your failover um, ranges ought to be the same. All right, so that's that, and I'm going to get ready to start this up. Now it's time to start my, my capture. So let's go to our primary, and I'm just going to say, well, 
we want to start dhcpd.service. You can just say dhcpd, but there we go. Now, take a quick look here at my capture. And I'll bring it over, and we can see that the servers are trying to talk to each other at this point. But of course, I didn't start the service on dot four yet, so the, the connection is failing. But this is certainly an indication that we want to start a conversation between the, the servers. Now, they're open for each other, so they can find each other because they're both running, but the service is not running. So let's go over here and do the same thing. We'll say, uh, whoops. Oh, that's not going to work. Oops. Okay, we're started. Now, what's happening in our capture now? Well, we can see that they have actually started to communicate. Here is the Sin Sinac Ack right there, and then there's this mystical magical value here, this new DHCP message. So this is DHCP failover. And we can see that they are communicating and talking a little bit about their parameters. There's not a whole lot going on right here. Right? Just a little bit about server configuration and how they're built. All right. So why are they talking to each other? Well, it really all comes down to what's going on with the clients, right? So now that they know that they're um, both up and running and they have a conversation the real key is who is handling which particular lease and then they have to let each other know so I'm going to go ahead and start up this VM this is just a, a, a DHCP client and I'm going to pause while this starts Okay, so our client number one has started up, and we can see that it pulled an address of 172.16.0.25. Pretty standard, right? DHCP servers are relatively easy to set up, relatively easy to get on their feet, and so this is totally what we, we expect. But in this topology, we've got a pair of servers, so what is actually going on? So let's take a look at our capture. And of course, 25 was in that range of 20 to 29 that I set up. Now we're looking at our capture. We can see that, you know, I note the change of the the uh, filter here, so I don't see the TCP connection for this. This is all uh, message types that are specific, so the straight up TCP is not not in this. Well, actually, let me do it this way. Um, we'll do IP dot ADDR. Oops, equals equals. do an AND IP.ADDR 172.16.0.4 there we go okay so this shows right our initial we're bringing the servers up only one is up and then they start communicating so sin sin act act so there we go now the rest of this is them just communicating back and forth hi how are you this is what I'm doing this is what you're doing fabulous and this is when the VM for the client is booting. Okay. Uh, let's see. We need we need our binding update. Oh shucks. So now now I'm going to go back to the other filter because I want to see the client exchange. Okay. Okay. So there we go. So you see that they're, they're communicating. Here we've got more communication. There we go. All right. So at this point, the client has started to, started to communicate. And right here, we can see that the client is going out there for a request. And dot three says, no, I'm not going to give you not going to give you an address. They're figuring it out at this point. So the client does this discover again. And at some point, one of the servers says, you know what, I'm going to send you an offer. And it turns out that it's dot four. Now, how did dot four decide? Well, in the discover, we've got these options down here. And one of them is a client identifier. Well, what is that? Turns out it's just a MAC address. All right. So, 
the offer gets made, the request, and then finally the acknowledgement. And what is it? It's dot 25. Well, that sort of tracks with what we see here. Okay, terrific. Normal DHCP operation. But what happened after that? Well, dot 4 said, hey, dot 3, I just gave somebody a lease. And so what dot 4 is saying is that, well, look, I just gave this lease out. And then dot 3 says, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. Now, why do they care? Well, it turns out that if one of the servers goes down or gets, you know, a link, link problem or something like that, or the service gets shut down, well, the other server has to pick up for the, the clients that had leases. And so that's the whole point. All right, so the reason that we talked about DHCP just briefly is because we wanted to remember that servers have to talk to each other. And so when we start looking at our primary and secondary DNS, well, we expect them to communicate also. And so the question is, what are we trying to get them to say? So what makes sense for us to have between the servers? Well, it's not like DHCP in the sense that, right, we're not, we're not offering the same set of uh, addresses to clients, right? We don't have the same range. We do want the same answers. Well, one of the keys in DNS primary and secondary is that you don't want your zone files all over the place. And by that, I mean that you really want to update them in one place. And then we want to push those updates to the, the secondaries or in the language of, of the RFCs, the slave. Now, it turns out that the, the master and slave servers are on exactly the same level. The only difference between them is the location of the files. So the zone files are going to exist on the master and then push them out to the slaves. And then the slaves can keep copies or just keep uh, resource records in memory. So we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. So when the servers are really communicating, it's not, hey, I just told somebody about something, you know, and I'm updating my fellow servers about what I just did. No, it's really all about getting the updated files. And that's the reason why you want to increment your um, serial number every time you update these files, because the secondaries will look at that number and determine whether or not they need to do what's called a zone transfer. Now the zone transfer is the transfer of all the resource records between the between the servers. Okay. Now there is, we've been using things like system control and, and we've been using NS lookup for things like this, but we do have another command that I'm going to introduce today and that is RNDC. Now RNDC has a, a security flavor to it, but we can force a transfer if we missed if we miss the zone transfer, right? They want to do it right quick as soon as they come up, uh, but uh, we don't always um, we don't always catch it, and so we can force a, a zone transfer by doing our NDC retransfer. Well, let's go to our uh, name servers, and then we'll take a look at some of the files and some of the updates. Whoops. So here is our primary, and here's our secondary. So maybe I should point this out just as a reminder, right? This particular file was etcnamed.conf. So to make my life a little easier, maybe I'll do this. I'll do this, and then I'll open up another terminal. And I'm going to go to my other location, which is var name. And we take a look at these files on the um, on the secondary. Let me do that too on the primary. All right. We take a look here. We can see that we've got my forward and reverse zones. Now I added another zone here. I added the look, 
look up uh, or the localhost reverse zone so that's one of the updates I'll talk about here in a sec so that's our location but take a look we've also got this slaves directory over there now I'm not I don't care about that on the primary but I do care about it on the secondary now I'm gonna talk about this too let me see now you can see what I I named my forward zone and my reverse zone here they're unused and that's because well they're unused in the in the name d.conf I'm not referencing these files at all but I'm just keeping them for backup uh, and then we've got this slaves directory well, what's in there well it turns out that these are backups so right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of these backups so I'm gonna get rid of this one and then we'll get rid of the reverse and I'll talk about what the whoops talk about these are what these are for here in a second okay so you can see nothing up my sleeve there we go now before I leave here um, one of the other files that we see all the time is this name D dot CA well what's in there turns out this is your root server hint section so we take a look at two things. We'll take a look at, we've got all of these name servers listed. And in case I forget, I'll say it here too. When you have authoritative uh, servers, so the primary and the secondary, or the master and the slave, they're all authoritative, meaning that they all have the answers for the zone. All authoritative servers are listed in the zone files. So we've got our list of name servers, and then we've got the IP addresses that go along with the name servers. But if we take a look at IANA, take a look here. All right, so we'll take a look at this first one, right? We've got a.rootservers.net, and then we've got a.rootservers.net, and then 198.41.04. Hey, take a look at IANA. Here's a, right? 198.41.0.4. How about that? And that one happens to be run by VeriSign. And so you can go out to IANA, go to you know the root zone manager, take a look at the root servers. And so it all ties together. So there's a reason why these things are here and a part of our builds. Okay, so that is the root servers file. And then that's really it. The only thing on the, the secondary is going to be the reverse zone lookup for localhost. The rest of these zone files are not going to be used at all. So you can see the naming convention here on the primary is quite a bit different, right? Because these are the files that I'm actually using. So the question is, if the secondary doesn't have any files, how does it work? Well, we'll see that here in a second when we start up our servers. And we'll go back over here because we're going to talk about this here in a second. Now I just realized that again our video is getting a little long so I'm going to pause here and I think this will just be two parts but we'll see. So I will pick up right here in part two.